Hi, everyone, and welcome to Developing with Cockroach GB. This is a developer-focused success program with a series of workshops and office hours to help you tackle your biggest developer aspirations. We want to help you get the most out of Cockroach DB, utilizing what you know so well with SQL and Postgres. If you've taken Cockroach University and you are a new to intermediate user of the Cockroach Serverless, bring us onto your journey. We want to help you get the most of the platform and help us improve your experience. Today is a module on connecting to serverless using JavaScript with John St. John. John is an enterprise architect here. Welcome, John. You're looking very festive today. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> and I. Um, oh, go ahead. And I am Lori Morita. I am a project manager here at Cockroach Labs. So before we get started, we do have some exciting news today. Cockroach Labs announced its Series F for $278 million in new funding, uh, a valuation of $5 billion. So I am beyond excited to be part of such an amazing, successful startup. Go check out the post on our website. I just posted the link. And without further ado, John, talk to me about what we are learning today. Yeah, sure. So um, as Laurie said, I'm John St. John. I'm an enterprise architect. And uh, I, myself and my team, we work a lot with uh, bigger companies, helping them get to production, understand how best to leverage CockroachDB uh, for their businesses. And But this series is really focused on CockroachDB serverless, which is uh, an easy way for developers to get started using CockroachDB in uh, what, what is called a serverless environment, which is really minimal setup. We handle all of the kind of rollout, deployment, scaling, uh, and you only pay for what you use, which is really a great way to consume it, whether it's um, a, a small project, getting familiar with CockroachDB. Uh, it's just a really, really easy way um, to get started. Uh, today, I wanted to focus on just connecting because we've had reports from folks that uh, that have trouble just getting started and connecting to CockroachDB. And uh, I decided to focus on uh, connecting with JavaScript because JavaScript's really common. And so, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm gonna, right. gonna walk you awesome. through. Cool. John is screen sharing now. All right. Awesome, we'll get right into it. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, we uh, I'll assume maybe some familiar with CockroachDB serverless. Uh, CockroachDB is a, is a distributed relational database that uh, really scales easily uh, to meet um, really demanding applications. And serverless is a way that you can instantly spin up a CockroachDB uh, cluster and pay for what you use. So. What I did in thinking about this and really wanting to, to make this uh, material really easy to consume is I created a, a, a repository that contains a number of different code samples for JavaScript. And I know that a lot of people also use TypeScript and uh, TypeScript compiles to JavaScript. Um, so for each of these samples, I do a, a, a JavaScript and a TypeScript example. So there's five different, uh, so just so you know, the, you can access this repository uh, at uh, github.com slash cockroach labs slash connect dash to dash serverless. And I'm gonna uh, go through this presentation as if I'm just a regular user uh, coming to this with, with nothing else other than uh, a, maybe a link to the repository. So I'm gonna clone it, I don't have any Nothing kind of kind of hiding, no no magic or anything like that. Um, I'll, I'll walk walk you through it um, from the beginning. So to to provide a nice a nice breadth of different libraries, uh, I chose uh, one one driver or client, uh, two ORMs or query builders, and two web frameworks. So the uh, so CockroachDB is PostgreSQL wire compliant, which means that uh, it's not, you know, CockroachDB was built uh, from the ground up. Uh, it does, it's not Postgres running uh, behind the scenes, but by wire compliant, we mean that you can use, you can interact with CockroachDB 
uh, using uh, clients and drivers that you would use with Postgres. So in the JavaScript world, the most commonly used driver is Node Postgres. Um, you might also know it is just PG. Um, when you import it, it's called PG. Uh, so that's the, the driver that I use. And then a couple of popular ORMs or query builders are Next and SQLize. So I'll show you examples of those. And then for web frameworks, I have Express and Koa, which are a couple popular web, web frameworks. And just to be clear, I'm not, there's actually no sample database involved in this. This is strictly connecting. So all of these examples are designed to connect, demonstrate that you've been able to success, successfully connect. Uh, and so there, there's not a bunch of other stuff. If, if your problem is connecting or you're trying to understand how that works, you can go here, you can check this out, you can make a couple changes to the configuration and it should just be able to run for you. So the first thing that I'm going to do is spin up a new cluster. So, and throughout this whole thing, I'll try to make my screen as uh, kind of big, the print as big as possible so you can see really clearly what I'm doing. Uh, without kind of cutting things off. Um, I guess maybe when I spin up the cluster, I won't, but once I go into the code, you should be able to see it really clearly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to cockroachlabs.cloud and click on the login with GitHub link. Uh, because I already have an account, uh, if you don't have an account, you can easily create one. And then that will bring me to my cluster dashboard. And I have a few clusters already created. Um, I created this one yesterday, Clumsy Hyena, that I used just to kind of go through to make sure everything's working well. Um, but I want to show you creating a brand new cluster. So when I click on that button, I see uh, I have serverless or dedicated. So serverless is what we're going to be looking at today. And technically, it's still in beta. Uh, it's fairly new. Um, and this is the free forever, pay for what you use option. And there are some limits to, um, or there are limits to what you can do in free, just in terms of what we call request units and, and also for storage. Um, but that should give you plenty of opportunity to play around with it. And after you've, if you want to move on from that, you can set a spending cap, which is really nice. So you could say like a $5, $10, $100 spending cap, whatever you want as you use it. So I'm gonna go through and select a cloud provider. I like to use GCP. Uh, there's different reads I can use. As I mentioned, there's a spending limit. And then the cluster name you can customize, but it, it gives me, uh, it generates one for me. In this, one, in this case, it's called Green Mall. And then I'll create my cluster. And it says it's usually ready in five to 10 seconds. I think that's usually the case. I think that was probably about five seconds. And my cluster is created. So once you create the cluster, you get this screen that pops up that you can access later and it's the connection info. And this would be the first place where we're kind of presented with a bunch of information where we're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on here? Um, I want to get connected, but what do I need? And um, rather than just kind of going through this really quickly, I'd recommend if it's the first time creating the cluster, just kind of read through it and understand it. And I'll walk you through the different options. So. There's three tabs across the, well, I guess, first of all, you can choose your operating system and we have Mac, Linux, and Windows. And the instructions vary just a little bit depending on what you're using. So I'm using a Mac and the, there's three tabs across the top. I have the command line, connection string, and connection parameters. So for the command line, Cockroach has a command line client and the command line client is just called Cockroach. And you can use that to connect to your cluster anytime. It has a lot of functionality. It's the native client. And I'd recommend using that. And I'll show you us connecting using that um, uh, in this session, uh, just to make sure that our connection string is working correctly. But for our application, we're actually a little more interested in the connection string tab. So there's really two steps to the connection string tab. There is uh, a step for downloading the CA certificate. And then there's the actually adding the connection string into your code. So hopefully and most- John, Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can I connect yeah. to my cluster without using the CA certificate? Or why is it necessary for me to use that? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think um, some people find that a little bit of a stumbling block because um, they're like, well, why do I have to connect you? Why do I have to get the CA certificate? I'm used to just connecting with, uh, you know, username and password and maybe a host name. Uh, so the CH certificate uh, is to uh, guarantee the security between your application or the client and the cluster. So when you connect using your browser, say to a secure website, you often see the padlock symbol kind of in the address bar, mm -hmm. and that's a secure connection with the website. What you don't know is that um, your computer uh, has typically ships with a, a trusted CA certificate, um, like a root CA certificate. And the way certificates work is that, and that's kind of like part of your system. And the, uh, I guess the company uh, that issued the certificate for the website you connect to is part of that chain of trust back to that root certificate. So, and that's built into the browser. Now, when you're connecting with an application or command line and you wanna establish that secure connection, well, um, we don't necessarily have a way to pull that off of your system. So we ask that you include it. And by including that, we guarantee the security of that connection and really that chain of trust back mm -hmm. to the certificate issuer. So, oh, yeah, so right now, you know, one thing I want to say is that we are working on some improvements to how you connect and being able to easily leverage the system certificates uh, in the coming months. Today, by downloading that certificate, you're really ensuring the security of that connection with the cluster. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that's really a helpful explanation. Yeah, sure. So to download that, uh, it's really simple. It's just a matter of copying that command. And I have a terminal here and I've already downloaded this, but it's not gonna hurt for me to download that again. And that certificate, um, so it's a curl command that actually pulls that certificate um, from, the, from the server and it puts it into my home directory. And we'll talk about this home directory in a minute because it is a area that sometimes users get tripped up when they're looking, uh, when they're connecting from their application. So what I've done is I've echoed out the value of home, which for me on, on my MacBook is users slash John St. John. And if I look at the contents, we'll see that um, I can list out, I think that's a little cut off. There we go. I can list out the contents. We can see that curl command actually downloaded that uh, to that directory. And that directory is going to be referenced when we dig into the connection string. So I just wanted to spend a minute and really call that out so that you could see that like that's what's happening when you run that command and it's why it's important to run that command. So the next section is getting the connection string. So I have a warning here that says your password will be provided only once. Copy the code below and save it to secure location. So this is another area that sometimes trips up users and I'm gonna just copy and paste this um, and I, I'll let you see my password because I will reset this cluster when I'm done, but I wanted to just make sure it's really clear what's going on. So I just open an editor and I'll make this really big for you. I seem to want to resize super evenly on my screen, but so you'll see here, um, and we'll, I'm going to break this down for you in just a minute. Uh, so you can see every element, but this is my password here. And you can see that uh, it's been it's part of this URL. Now, if I close this screen and I go back to connect, so this button connect is always here. And then I go back to the connection string and I copy it. And I go down here and paste that again. You'll see that that password is replaced with this text that says enter password. So um, that warning says, we only let you uh, download the password that first time when it's generated. And subsequent times when you try to connect, you're gonna have to have that saved somewhere. So I like to grab that password and I like to save it to my password manager or somewhere else. In fact, I like to grab the entire connection string and save it there. Now, if you do lose that password or you can't find it or you forgot to copy it, 
it's as easy as going to the SQL users and changing the password. As long as you have access to the console, you can go back in and change the password. Oh, nice. So it'll let you create a new one? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'll just open up the, yeah. So it's got a, a screen there where I can put in my new password. So, so that's, yeah, maybe another area that people get tripped up. And that's going to apply whether we're connecting with JavaScript or Java or Python or anything. Um, so important information. So let's take a look at this query string. And I was thinking a little bit while I was preparing for this, how best to break apart this query string, because it's a little overwhelming. It's really huge. And so I've made this little tool that's currently just local on my machine, but uh, maybe we'll publish it, or maybe it's enough just to see it in this video. But basically, I can put my connection string in here, and it'll break it up by these different values. So we'll see that we have username is John, and we can see the John up here. You can see the password currently is enter password. And I've got a warning off to the side that just says it's placeholder text. It has to be changed. And then I have a host. This is the cockroach, uh, the cockroach DB serverless host, which is at cockroachlabs.cloud. Uh, That's up here. And then I have a port, which is the default cockroach DB port of 26257. I have a database up here, which is the default database. It's is called default DB. And further over, I scroll over, um, I have an SSL mode, which is called, uh, which is set to verify full, which is what we require for Cockroach DB serverless. It's going to tell it to look for that uh, CA certificate. Uh, and then I have a certificate path here, which is uh, the path to my certificate. And I have a warning here about the home uh, variable. So the home variable is an environment variable. I showed it to you in the terminal. If I echo it, it's displayed. But it may not be interpreted by all the client libraries. So when you put that into your application, whether you're con connecting with Node Postgres or Express or whatever, it's not necessarily going to interpret that. So the warning is um, more specifically that we should replace that value with the actual path, the full path. And I'll show you how we do that. And John, we did receive a question. Mm -hmm. Are the certificates unique for each cluster? So they are, the, the CA certificate is not. I don't believe it is. Um, I believe it's going to be the same across. So the, you know, it's sort of like when you connect to a website, mm -hmm. um, that uh, this the, the CA, the kind of the, Certificate Authority, which is what the CA stands for, they might issue uh, a certificate to a lot of different websites, but it's going to be the same Certificate Authority that's generating those certificates. So in a similar way, um, the Certificate Authority is going to be the same, but there's going to be unique certificates for each cluster that you don't really have to worry about. Um, and that, that uh, uh, CA certificate can change. And I believe it changed a few months ago. So we send out a notification to our customers if you do need to update that. And then the, I think there's an overlap period for users to update that. Oh, okay. Um, nice. Yeah. I noticed that this is getting cut off, cut off a little bit, but on the screen. Um, and then the last, uh, the last uh, parameter that's set in that connection string is what's called options. And that's uh, kind of a flexible field for the connection string where we pass in the, the cluster name. So that's the green mole. And then you'll see that there's always some digits attached to the end of it. Um, so let's fix these warnings and then let's test the connection string. And then we'll get into our JavaScript. Um, so I'm going to go back to this. Uh, little scratch pad. And the first thing I'm going to do is go up here and replace that with my password. And then the second thing I'm going to do 
is go back to my terminal where I echo, echo the contents of home. I'm going to scroll right, and then I'm going to go to home, and that all looks good. So, so a lot of times when, when we're working on something and we're trying to solve a problem, like say connecting, it's good to kind of test each thing along the way. So before we start trying to launch an application and write an application, it'd be good to validate that this connection string actually works. So I mentioned before that there is this, uh, this cockroach client that you can download so and run it from the command line. And it's just called cockroach. And if you follow the instructions for installing it um, back on the on this screen, on the connect screen, the first one is setting up that client. And I highly recommend you use that connect initially just for any if you want to create a database if you want to uh, create tables uh, you know just read in some SQL if you're doing a migration there's lots of different uses for this but if we want to just get a simple SQL connection then we can use cockroach SQL and then the connection string and so I'm testing to make sure that connection screen uh, strings valid before we get into to more of the details of JavaScript. So I was able to connect successfully because I see this welcome screen. And here I have a SQL prompt to show databases. I can see the databases that are there. So great. So we're um, fully connected. I think I've talked about the different parts of the connection string. And I, the next part is really jumping into the JavaScript code. So as I mentioned, I set up this repository. And I'm going to go ahead and exit out. This up a little bit so we can see it. Oop. Doesn't like that. I just noticed it was getting a little cut off. So I'll go ahead and exit out with the backslash Q it takes me out of that cockroach client. And I set up this live stream directory that's currently empty. Well, I'm gonna make it empty. <laughs> Sorry, it might take a second. I think it had all the node modules checked out. Okay, so we have an empty directory. So now I'm just gonna do a git clone on that. Cool. And what that did is that checked out that code. And then I'm going to use VS Code for the rest of this. So I'll do open folder. And then do projects, do live stream, connect to serverless, and open this up. Cool. So this is the repository. And I'll, I'm going to, again, I'm going to make this as big as possible. And I'm going to try to make sure we don't get cut off at the bottom of the screen. Cool. A little bigger. So let's see. So this is the README that we we're looking at before. And if I pop open the directory, um, so the README has kind of an overview of everything that's in the repository. And um, hopefully in the future, we'll have uh, samples from other languages. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, Node Postgres. It'll be a little easier if I go back to the repository to see the readme. I just want to show you the format. So each of these libraries has its own readme. And in this case, connect to Cockroach DB serverless using JavaScript and Postgres. And then once you pull it, it tells you how to get it set up. So we do an NPM install, and then we just run it using Node. And then if you want to set up your own project, it's just got the NPM install and the, and the libraries that we're using, the Node modules. So all of these um, directories have that. So I'm going to pull up a terminal. Can I close that up? Let's see. I'm going to open app.js. Sorry, I'm trying to make it so it's the most readable. So 
I think next I'll take you uh, take you for a spin through App.js. So the J, uh, JavaScript, all the code for J the JavaScript examples is in the App.js in that folder. And then for TypeScript, it's in app.ts. And they really follow a very simple format. So we have a section that imports the requirements. We have a configuration section. And then we have a section that actually runs uh, some type of a query to ensure that we're connected or demonstrates that we're connected. So I'm going to show you how the config configuration works. So one thing that I think is a little confusing when people go into Connect is that a lot of times examples that you see for libraries will show something like this. Let's see, so this is Node Postgres. They'll show something like like this. I'll make it a little bigger. They'll say, let's create a, a pool, a connection pool, and let's set all these, this user, the host, the database, the password, and port, right? It's all the stuff that we saw here. The problem is, is that our, our query string, our connection string has some additional information. It's got your cluster name. It's got a CA certificate. So I think a lot of times people are looking around, they're like, how do I do all this stuff? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on connecting using the connection string. So if I scroll down on the official Node Postgres documentation, I can see connection URI. And I have an example that uses a connection string. All the libraries that I'm showing today support using a connection string. And so that's the approach that, that, that I'm using for connecting. Now, to make it a little easier for you when you pull this down to make sure you're changing the right things because the connection string is really big, actually break it the configuration down into the individual components. So I have a section that has must be changed, the username, password, the certificate path, the cluster. Those are all going to be different for you. And then what might need to be changed is the, the database. So we're just going to connect to default DB. But if you had your own database there, you need to change that. And then the CRDB host. So this one's the GCP host. Uh, if you're using, uh, you may need to change the host. And then I build the connection string by just concatenating the username. And then there's a separator to the password, to the at symbol, to the host, et cetera. And this is going to be the same across every single library I'm showing today. So I'm taking a little time to walk you through it. But once I show you the first one, it's going to be really clear how it all fits together. So, so we're, we're splitting up the connection string, building it up. I think it makes it a little bit simpler. For each of these, you have an option. So the simplest option is for you to change the text here. And I'll show you how that works. So let me go back to these components that I know work really well because I tested the connection string. I'm going to change these manually here. That path is right. I'm going to grab just the cluster part here, and I'm going to replace it here. So I can go in and I can copy and paste this into the code. It's, you know, when you're deploying code, or even if you want to I'll show you if you want to test multiple libraries. You could also set it as an environment variable. There's nothing special about these environment variables. Um, we do support some environmental environment variables in Cockroach. And there are some Postgres environment variables. I just set these up for this demo and for all of these sample projects. And I'm going to show you how to set those um, on my on Mac in a minute. Um, but you know, the plain string is like the easiest because you can look at it and make sure that it's correct. And then uh, for all of uh, so for all of these, I want to um, I'm going to change into the directory for Node Postgres, and then I'm going to run. Sure, you can see this. I'm going to run uh, npm install, or you can just run npm i. That's going to install all the dependencies. And then the next thing I'll do, let me move this up just a little bit, is run Node. App.js to run the actual application. And fortunately, I guess things are going, going pretty well my day or today. They don't always, but when I ran that, um, I can see here that it provides a result. 
the result has a set of rows. And all this is doing is returning the version of CockroachDB that's on the cluster. So I know that I've connected the cluster. I've executed the select version statement, which is right here, select version. And it's returning back a result set, um, and I can see. So this code set up so if you do hit an error, you would see an error there. So if you were to have misconfigured your cluster or your password or something like that, you should see an error. Cool. So the next thing, so that's been successful. Um, I want to show you all the other code samples, and we'll probably move through those pretty quickly. But to make it easier for me, so I don't have to uh, change the code in every place, I'll show you how to set these environment variables so that you can run all of the examples. So I'm running this export command, and what that basically does is it sets the environment variable. So in that case, and then copy and paste this and I can put in my password. And we'll do two more. Put that one just in case. This path. And then copy and paste to make sure I don't ask excellent something this is our green mole 206 okay so so what's going to happen for all these other code samples is that when we set the username it's going to say oh i found the environment uh, variable and it'll use that instead of this one because as you'll see let me switch this out this. We'll go into the next example, which is SQLize. And this one has the same code configuration. And with SQLize, I just call SQLize as this authenticate function that just basically logs a message that the connection's been uh, successfully established. So I'm going to go um, CD up a level, go to SQLize, and then I'll do that npm i. And then all I have to do now that those environment variables are set is to run node app.js. And I can see that that sample code is working as well. And then um, likewise, I can go up to, uh, which one's this? This is SQLize. I can go up to next and I'll do the same one. Uh, do the npm install. But app.js, this one, similar to the first one, returns a result set. And when I go to Express, I'll show you these are just slightly different. We installed the dependencies. We call app.js. And so Express and Koa are web frameworks, so they're going to be accessible via the browser. So I set them up to each use a different port. So I can go to localhost 3000 which is running Express right now. And I can see that the version is displayed there for that one. And I'll control C that, and I'll go up to Koa and do the npm install. Put up JS. This is running on port 301. Let's open up a new browser so it's a little more obvious that we're actually getting a new application, which I get version there using that library and that it also gives a little bit of output for node. Um, so those are the five JavaScript examples. And then the TypeScript ones are just a little bit different. So I want to, I'll just run through at least a couple of those. Um, TypeScript compiles to JavaScript. So TypeScript uses uh, something called a uh, the TypeScript compiler, which is installable. Um, you can install it using like homebrew. There's different ways to install it. So you could do like a brew install PSC, and that would call it if you're on Mac. Um, or you can just go to the, 
the TypeScript compiler website. And if I run git git c, um, gives you a bunch of information about the command. Um, but basically, let me flip back to the documentation really quickly. So you can see the TypeScript examples. TypeScript, go to node Postgres. Instructions are very, very similar. The only difference we do our NPM install is that when you run the TypeScript compiler, uh, it'll take the, uh, the app.ts, which is a TypeScript file, and um, it'll have a TypeScript config that will actually write it to uh, a different directory for distribution called uh, dist or DST app.js. And then to run that, you just run uh, node against the app.ts just like you're seeing. Um, and I'll just open up just one of those. So in this directory, we have the app.ts and that one is really similar. We input our requirements, we have the configuration, and then basically we execute the statement. And then the ts config is a TypeScript configuration that has an out, output directory of dist. Um, make this visible. So in node Postgres, let's make sure I'm in the right place. I can view npm install, utsc, and then it creates that uh, dist directory. That's going to return the version as well, SQLize. I'll show you really quickly if I list out, I don't have a disk directory, but if I run the TypeScript compiler, it creates the disk directory. Execute that. Um, gives me the connection has uh, been established successfully. Give that a second. And I am running through all of them. Get that result set with the version. That's the npm install. Oh, PSC. Compiler and then run that. For 3002, I guess, but on 3003, you can see that. And then our last one is COA, the NPM install, the TSC, and we'll run that. And then we get to 3004. So it's a really simple pattern to, to run all these. And really, my goal is to give you like the bare minimum that you can be confident about your ability to connect in all these different libraries to your CockroachDB serverless cluster, um, which, you know, I mean, just to plug CockroachDB serverless, it's, it's a great way. I mean, technically it's still in beta, but you saw it is so easy to spin up a cluster. And as you can see from these code samples, it's so easy to connect as well. Like there's really no reason for you to not kind of give it a give it a whirl and kind of see what it can do. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. I guess I would leave you with maybe one other I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think the only thing I had one other tab open, which um, I just want to reiterate that um, these connection strings, there's nothing magic about them. They're part of our compliance with the Postgres wire um, being Postgres wire compatible. I've demonstrated five different libraries here. There's lots of other libraries out there. Um, virtually all the ones I looked at, you can connect directly just with the connection string. You just look for that. You don't have to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, and if it's compatible with Postgres, it's probably compatible with Cockroach. And if you really want to dig a little bit more into these connection URIs, uh, we follow really closely to the Postgres documentation and 
uh, you know, this section of the documentation really goes into a lot of detail about what the connection URI is, what some different kind of variations are on it. Um, and we've got lots of channels uh, of support uh, to help you, our Slack channel, our forum, um, you know, these sessions, uh, we, we do typically run office hours every two weeks. So if you're still struggling, please reach out. Um, we really want to help you. Um, and yeah, I yeah think that's definitely. It. Thanks, John, for the walkthrough. That was amazing. It was very straightforward and uh, really helpful to see the different examples. Uh, for those joining, cool. if you have any questions for John, post them now. I do want to remind you, if you are watching this from somewhere else other than YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash cockroach TV. Recordings always available there. Uh, John, we did have a few questions come in. So let me see. I think you just touched on this one. Is cockroach DB compatible with all libraries that support Postgres? Oh, yeah. One thing I can mention um, is that typically we are compatible with most uh, PostgreSQL compatible libraries. I uh, did run into, sometimes there's some minor things you have to do. I think it was on next. Um, you know, CockroachDB is becoming uh, a lot more widely adopted these days. So a lot of these libraries actually have specific documentation on Cockroach or mention uh, uh, being compatible with Cockroach. Yeah, I think it was Next, actually, uh, when I ran it initially without this uh, version, uh, it didn't actually work. Um, and then mm -hmm. their documentation mentioned that for CockroachDB, you need to pass in what's this is considered the Postgres version, version um, to make it work. And so there may be some minor caveats on the libraries, but mm -hmm. typically there is good compatibility. One thing is it doesn't mean that we support every Postgres feature. So when we say wire compatible, it means that we follow the same uh, protocol, what's what's called a wire protocol, which is how we exchange information uh, between the client and the server. But there's very specific Postgres features that we don't necessarily support. Um, and there's a bunch of really cool stuff that we support that goes way beyond Postgres. Um, so, but just something to be aware of. So. Let's see, we had another one come in. This actually came in in the beginning. Do you recommend using the user that's automatically created for the cluster or creating a separate one? Yeah, so I've been thinking about um, a good session to do in the future. It'd be on just kind of best practices for Cockroach DB serverless. And I just use the one that was created by default. But typically, when you're connecting from your application, you can create a separate uh, SQL user either from the console or directly in the uh, connecting, say, using like the Cockroach client using SQL, you can create a user. Mm -hmm. When you connect with SQL, you can also be very specific about what that user can do. And when you're developing an application, typically it's for security reasons, best to restrict the access to what you expect the application to need. So that might be full access on a specific database or certain type of access on certain tables. So um, I think this was easy for the demo and connecting, but um, you know, what you really want to do is create a user that has specific privileges for what you think the application should be doing. Right. We did have a question just come in from LinkedIn. What dialect do you suggest to use? There's Postgres and CockroachDB one. Yeah, so I assume they're talking about the dialect of SQL. Um, and so there's a strong overlap between uh, CockroachDB SQL and Postgres SQL. And I recommend that you use, use the documentation that's really extensive on uh, the Cockroach DB website that really goes into um, kind of all the nitty gritty about the SQL statements that are supported in Cockroach to kind of understand what we support. And if you run into issues, that would be a great place to look to, to figure out if you're doing it the right way. There's lots of code samples. 
Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check out our docs page. I just posted the link there. Um, very helpful. Let's see. We do have another question. When do you use a driver versus an ORM versus a framework? Yeah. So typically, um, you may have noticed that there were a couple different libraries I was using that had similar output. Um, and uh, so a driver typically is going to be uh, like Node Postgres is going to be, I guess, maybe a lower level way of interacting with the database, executing SQL statements, uh, et cetera. And a lot of times the driver is going to be leveraged by uh, an ORM or a framework. And in some ways, frameworks leverage ORMs. So uh, you always need to use some type of a driver. And lots of people like to use ORMs. Or I, I saw, I think they referred to Next as a query builder, um, but basically, an ORM is like an object relational uh, mapper. Uh, it's really designed to make it so you don't have to write SQL and it'll generate SQL for you. You can define your objects and then you can just interact with your objects. Um, so in some cases, it makes it a little bit easier. And then a full-fledged framework like Express or Koa are typically used for a specific purpose like building a web application. Um, and a lot those, like I mentioned, those will leverage, uh, always leverage a driver and will sometimes have an ORM or can be used with different ORMs. These are all, these are all really good questions coming in. Let's see, I think this yeah. is another question. Can I connect to CockroachDB using JavaScript running in the browser? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. There's, I mean, a lot of people ask that. So when we start talking about JavaScript, People think about JavaScript running in the browser mm -hmm. uh, versus running, say, with with Node. And people a lot of times think, oh, well, you know, can I just connect directly from the browser? And I think there actually it there are some projects that that explore that. Um, problem with the browser is that it's not a secure environment. So all those little details that we saw, like the user's password and other things, are not secure in the browser. Um, so mm -hmm. typically, the way people interact with the database from the browser is they would have a server-side application, maybe running on Node or one of those frameworks we saw, um, like Express or Koa, that would expose a REST API or some sort of an endpoint that the browser can then securely query. Um, so I wouldn't recommend running it directly in the browser. I'm sure you can find examples of people that have done it, but uh, definitely not recommended for a, a production app or something that's out in the public. So right, yeah. Well, we are running at the top of the hour, so as a reminder, this is not your only path to support. Please reach out on our forum, community Slack, check out our docs pages. This will actually be our last session of the year for developing with CockroachDB. We will pick back up in 2022. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined. Thank you, John, for the walkthrough. That was amazing. And yeah. happy holidays to everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hope this was helpful. Oh, and if you found it helpful, make sure to like. Oh, yes. <laughs> good <laughs> on the, good on the repeat. point, John. <laughs> Definitely go to our YouTube and give us a thumbs up, give us a thumbs down, comment with any feedback. We love to hear what you think. All right. Absolutely. Happy holidays. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>